let me give you a sense of how this panel conversation is going to go. So we've all decided that a more conversational format would be more interesting for all of you um, and maybe um, we'll be able to get at some of the heart of the, the issues that are on top of mind. So each of our panelists is going to provide roughly five minutes of introductory remarks um, and they're going to focus on what is top of mind around environmental legacies. Um, and then after that, we're going to ask each other questions on all of the issues that come up for environmental legacies. So the techno technological um, responses for addressing and preventing environmental legacy issues, um, the necessity for monitoring so we understand where the environmental legacy issues might be happening happening, um, as well as the overall governance overlay to help us um, address these issues um, moving forward. So an understanding of, of, of them from the past um, and into the future. So with that, now that everybody is settled, um, I'm going to give just a, a single name and title um, down the line. And then if y'all are interested, um, I think more detailed biographies are provided. Um, and each of the panelists, you may, you may provide a little bit more information so that the audience knows where you're coming from. So next to Dr. Brantley is Scott Perry. He's with the Department the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Um, sort of working our way down, we have Jennifer Baca, who is a professor at Pennsylvania State, um, Dave Kenny, who is with Trout Unlimited, and Dale Arnold, who's with the Ohio Farm Bureau. So with that, we'll go in this order, sort of from Sue towards this end. We'll end with Dale, who promises me that he gives a, a rousing, um, um, <laughs> rousing five minutes. So. Um, Mr. Perry. Sure. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, I've been with the department since uh, 2000. I'm a, I'm a career environmental protection professional. I started out as a lawyer with their Bureau of Regulatory Counsel focusing on um, energy matters, including radiation protection, oil and gas, and alternative energy. Uh, and in 2010, I was asked to hang up my counselor hat and, and uh, manage the oil and gas program. And it's been um, been a very exciting career change for me. Um, the reason why I wanted to be here today is because I don't think enough uh, smart people are talking about this legacy issue. Um, the legacy that we have, the legacy uh, and the legacy we could have, but the challenges that we face with the legacies we have, um, and potential futures. I think there's, there's two potential futures for the legacy of shale gas development in Pennsylvania. Um, one replicates the legacy we have today, and another one I think is actually much more positive. And I want to spend some time talking about that briefly. But first, um, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm always surprised at how little Pennsylvanians really understand their own um, oil and gas history. And uh, the, the estimates of the number of wells that have been drilled in Pennsylvania since 1859 are, are kind of all over the map. Um, but we've settled on um, a current legacy of approximately 200,000 unplugged abandoned wells in Pennsylvania that we, and we do not know where they are at. So the, just the enormity of, of the challenge there and to try and put some, some metrics around this, with every gas well permit we get, we receive $250 uh, that goes to plug abandoned wells. And this year we estimate that we'll receive approximately $400,000. So if I receive $400,000 of plug abandoned wells and I'll do lowball the estimate at $35,000 to, to plug a, a well, um, that's $7 billion that will be needed to, to address this 200,000 uh, well issue. So again, assuming 400,000 a year, $35,000 a well, I estimated that at that rate, it'll take us 17,500 years to plug those wells. So even if we were to radically increase the number to $40, $40 million per year towards plugging, that's still 175 years to, to address this problem. Now, not every single one of these wells is posing a, a risk, or, nor may it ever uh, pose a risk. But I just wanted to give folks an understanding of, of Pennsylvania's history, um, which, which is to, to not seriously address this issue. Some of our challenges, some of our impediments to, to addressing the issue, aside from the money, is frankly the, the structure of our laws. Um, the, the bonding requirements in Pennsylvania are very low. Wells that were drilled before 1984 require no bond. 
wells that were drilled, conventional wells drilled after 1984 uh, have a maximum blanket bond of $25,000. So for example, we have a conventional operator in Pennsylvania that has 23,500 wells on a $25,000 bond. We did increase that bonding amount for unconventional wells. There is now a maximum blanket bond of $600,000, which would might plug three or four shale wells should we need to access that bond. Um, th there's also a problem with the definition of what it means to be an abandoned well. Um, as long as a well produces any oil or gas, it is not an abandoned well. So therefore, wells can be kept in production long beyond their economic, economically valuable life. And then you compound that with the fact that we have very, very weak laws to prevent transfers of wells to very low capitalized companies or even individuals. Um, there are many wells in Pennsylvania that are owned by, by people and they heat their house with this, with this well. And they do not have the resources. They do not have $35,000, $50,000 to plug a gas well once it goes dry. Um, so those are our challenges. Um, if we continue down the road that we're on, we're going to continue to see much of the same, I believe. But I'm very optimistic about the future for a couple of reasons. First is that we are dealing with a different industry. We are dealing with an industry that has um, much greater financial resources than the conventional folks of old. And I've already seen some, some very interesting uh, site construction and re restoration practices that have been promoted by our sister agency, DCNR, where, and this, this might be tough to take, but I believe that the legacy of the unconventional industry may actually be to leave Pennsylvania's ecosystem better than, than it was before they got here. Um, superior restoration practices, um, including uh, deep ripping of well pads after they're restored. They, studies by Penn State are already showing that the soil conditions are superior to the surrounding forest. Uh, pipeline restoration practices that introduce a diverse uh, variety of species that promote um, species uh, habitat and show again a, su a superior ecological mix along pipeline restored right away than the surrounding forest. I don't know if folks have spent some time in Penn's woods, but our understory is not particularly ecologically diverse. It consists a lot of things that deer don't like to eat, like fern and mountain laurel and rhododendron, things like that. So I'm excited about this potential future that, that doesn't replicate the mistakes we've made in the past, and I can't wait to talk about it more with you guys here today. Thanks, Scott. I'm going to start a timer too. It's good practice. Um, so I'm Dr. Jen Baca. I'm an assistant professor of geography at Penn State. Um, I have the pleasure of being a colleague of Sue's. Um, so she has set the stage nicely for a lot of the research that we're doing at Penn State. Um, so I'm an energy geographer, um, and I came to that field because I'm a native Pennsylvanian from the Scranton area. So I grew up in the legacy of the anthracite coal mining era. Um, you know, we still have the column banks that um, scar our landscape out there. Um, and I didn't know that, um, you know, areas without column banks existed until I went south to Washington, D.C. for college. Um, so environmental legacy has been part and parcel of me ever since I was born because, you know, what brought my family to that area was the coal mining industry and both grandfathers worked in the coal mines. And so I grew up understanding energy politics, so I guess it's only natural that I um, studied energy for my entire adult career as well. Um, so before going to grad school, I worked for quite a long time um, as an economic consulting, as an economic consultant, um, understanding the electricity deregulation experiment in the US. I spent a good five years studying um, the debacle that was the California energy crisis. And then I started to study biofuels and the biofuel boom, which also had some legacy impacts here in Pennsylvania. And then in studying biofuels, um, the fracking boom um, occurred. And then that was a really nice opportunity for me to start doing research back here in Pennsylvania um, because there's a lot of connections across these three different policy fields that you know, made me think that there are some interesting opportunities to you know, um, be able to come back to Penn State and study the regulatory landscape in more depth. So what I do is um, pull together uh, methods from political and industrial ecology. And what that means is I study the flow of materials and energy through a production system and then look at how those material and energy flows are shaped and shaped by the regulatory landscape. So what I've been doing in the context of fracking is trying to understand um, the, new regulatory, the new regulatory challenges that have been brought on by fracking. 
and then also how different stakeholders have responded and what the space for innovation is on the regulatory side. Um, Sue in her slides um, briefly introduced FRAC focus. I would point to that as a, as a hybrid regulatory um, innovation in which you have the public uh, the public sector and the private sector coming together to try to provide more information to the public um, about the chemicals that are being used in the fracking process. Um, what I'm doing here um, in Pennsylvania right now, um, if we had better weather and time for a field trip, we only have to go a good 15, 20 miles um, up towards Potter Township to study the new ethane cracker plant that um, is under construction as a result of um, the cheap um, natural gas prices and the ethane byproducts um, that are being produced in this part of the Marcellus and Utica shales. So we're trying to develop a petrochemicals industry in the northern part of Appalachia. We have a plant sited here in just outside of Pittsburgh, but there's also two others under construction in Ohio and West Virginia. So what I've been doing is trying to map out the supply chain um, associated with the Pittsburgh cracker plant um, and then map on the regulatory landscape. So I have some maps that are showing the different federal and state environmental regulations yes. that would apply to each of the different nodes of the supply chain. And then I'm trying to understand what's happening at the municipal level. So at the municipal level here in Pennsylvania, um, municipalities have zoning ordinances and, they, and that's their form of power and their ability to regulate um, where oil and gas production can take place. And so I'm trying to understand that supply chain. Um, and then I guess um, just as one of the prompts that we received for the panel, um, the environmental legacy issue that's on my, the forefront of my mind right now, um, perhaps some of you have seen in the news um, concerns that um, the fracking industry is the next financial crisis um, because unfortunately the industry hasn't been profitable or so say our Wall Street sages. Um, and there's a new book out recently by the journalist um, Bethany McLean called Saudi America, where she's trying to dig into this, whether or not um, the industry might be the next financial crisis. And I'm wondering if um, that argument comes to fruition. Now, this is the, this act, just for a little bit of background, this is the journalist who sort of blew the lid off the Enron case, and she wrote the book, The Smartest Men in the Room. Um, so she has this experience of um, doing some critical investigative journalism on the finance side, but if this um, actually does occur and you know hydraulic fracturing is no longer profitable, well, what do we do with this infrastructure build out um, that's currently ongoing to support things like the cracker plant, um, but also um, a lot of the um, data that Scott provided us. So what do we do in that case? Um, because it doesn't seem that um, in my review of the um, governance proceedings that we're really thinking about um, how to guard against the bus cycle that all too frequently accompanies these boom cycles. And so I think that fracking um, and unconventional drilling provides us a new opportunity to be innovative and think about you know, how we can incorporate such thinking into our regulatory structures. And that would be my prompt for the group. And I look forward to further discussions about that um, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so yeah, thanks for having me. I'm uh, Dave Kinney. I am uh, Eastern Policy Director for Trout Unlimited. Um, I'm probably the least qualified person up here. I spent 10 years as a newspaper reporter and 10 years as an author and a couple of years doing this. So, um, you know, if you're wondering, if you flip to the bio and you're wondering how I ended up here, you're, you're not alone. Um, you know, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective of how Chad Unlimited um, looks at these issues. So in Pennsylvania, we, um, our, our first real, um, uh, our, our longest serving staffer is a woman named Amy Wolf, and, and she's made her mark in doing uh, abandoned mine drainage work um, up in the Kettle Creek, so it's West Branch of the Susquehanna Basin. Um, and, you know, doing tons of work over 20 years to try to uh, treat the effects of, of historic um, coal mining uh, damage. And so I think that that is instructive. I mean, it's been, been time consuming. It's been really expensive. Um, you know, she, she's worked on a few miles of, of stream over this, this period of time. And, and so I think when that, that sort of affects our viewpoint of how we look at this new energy development um, that's happened over the last 10 years. And so I think the focus has, has largely been on um, you know, trying to uh, avoid or minimize the impacts at the outset. Um, Trout Unlimited about, ten, about two years ago um, kind of 
reviewed our, our approaches to energy development. Um, and our policy, uh, you know, the, the national policy was, was built around this kind of I this idea of responsible energy development. So the, the, the classic avoid, minimize, mitigate, uh, and, and monitor kind of, um, approach. And so we've worked pretty hard in, in, in trying to be collaborative, working with industry, working with agencies, um, getting our grassroots involved and, and educated um, and, and, and trying to put in place practices and policies that uh, and encourage practices and policies that, that will uh, limit impacts uh, going forward. Um, I think we've been maybe more successful on the, on the avoid side of the, the equation. We've done some work in, in uh, out west in trying to work with you know our partners uh, at the forest service for instance and, and trying to uh, limit areas where this stuff is happening trying to identify special places special um, uh, trout habitat that that um, you know we want to focus either um, minimization efforts or, or at least uh, uh, or, or you know on the other end of the the equation trying to prevent that that sort of uh, development happening in those areas and and you know, we've had some, some success there. My predecessor here um, spent six or seven years working on, uh, working with Scott and others and trying to sort of improve the regulatory regime here in Pennsylvania. And I, I think we've seen some strides there. And we've also put together a monitoring network. So, you know, we've got 14,000 monitors in Pennsylvania, um, thousands more in West Virginia and Virginia. And it, one of the ways, and, and probably the most successful way, ways we've engaged them in this issue is to have them go out to their local waters and do some baseline monitoring um, in advance of, of uh, shale gas development or in advance pipeline development and continue to, to do that, going out there monthly uh, if, if actual uh, development is happening, going out more frequently and, and collecting information about their, their local waters, both stream chemistry and also sort of visual, visual stuff. And, and so that monitoring network continues. My focus has largely been on, on pipelines of the past couple of years. And again, in this idea of, of trying to be forward thinking and preventative, one of the projects that, that I'll highlight is, is a GIS analysis that we did of um, areas of ecological significance in the Delaware River Basin and sort of the surrounding states uh, <coughs> where we looked at um, data sets across four themes. Uh, we looked at uh, high quality fisheries, uh, areas of, of high water quality, intact lands and, and biodiversity. We essentially tried to stack them and come up with uh, a heat map that would identify areas of e ecological significance that need to be taken into account when major pipeline infrastructure is, is going through. And, and you know, I, I know that pipeline companies do this. Uh, and we, we had them involved. We had a focus group where we brought, brought government folks involved, uh, government agencies that are involved in this issue, uh, pipeline industry, both uh, ones that are working on gathering lines and ones that are working on major transmission um, lines and, and had them involved in, in the, the conversation about how this would be useful. And, you know, we understand that the, the industry is already sort of doing this, this stuff, but we wanted to highlight this for, uh, for conservation groups, highlight this for government agencies, and, and hope, hopefully this can be sort of a, a basis for, you know, sound conversations about pipeline siting uh, when a proposal comes through. Uh, that we can identify and show why an area is is uh, an area that should be either avoided or there should be enhanced uh, minimization or, or mitigation there. So that's what that's what I'm working on. Dale. Hi, I'm Dale Arnold. I'm with the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, and I really appreciate listening to Susan and Scott and Jennifer and David. You've become basically my best friends in the last few minutes <laughs> because um, what I can also say is this is almost like welcome to my world. It's interesting. The um, I'm glad we didn't meet last night basically here in the restaurant or in the bar because I tell you this, we could have started talking about 7 o'clock last evening and we'd still be sitting out there talking today and forgetting about all of you. But no, when you talk about energy development, it's interesting is this, when you talk about shale uh, oil and gas drilling development, which has been going on here for the last 10 years, it's interesting that those current developments, those current developments are making us very much aware of a number of particular issues that have to have been addressed in this region of the United States for a number of decades, a number of decades. I've been with the Ohio Farm Bureau for 30 some years and I'll tell you this, many of the things that Susan and Scott and Jennifer and Dave were talking about, I was helping farmers and rural residents and community leaders address 
well before Marcellus and Utica Shale development was happening here. A number of things have been happening here. I want you to think about this. This part of the United States, Saudi Arabia of the world, in the late 1800s through World War I. You talk about oil and gas development, it was here and worked its way out to different things. Before that, I'll tell you this. I want you to think about this in this area, because this is the way I say it in Ohio. You see successive waves of energy development. In the mid to late 1800s, first it was timber. And I can show you pictures basically in Pennsylvania and Ohio where literally you are planting corn in areas where you're seeing forestation going on now. Forestation, mm -hmm. reforestation that needed to be done. Coal mining, when you talk about shaft mines, when you talk about old strip, when you talk about new strip, when you talk about repair, remediation, when you talk about water control, many of the things I'm working with farmers basically trying to address a number of issues on coal mines, both subsurface and surface that were closed in the 1950s and 60s and the problems are still going on today, people are seeing with regard to that. Oil and gas, this current stage is probably about the fourth or fifth wage wave of oil and gas development. You're correct. When you take a look at that map, basically in Pennsylvania, of the number of wells that were drilled during the first two or three stages of development, Ohio very much is the same. Over a quarter of a million wells were drilled in Ohio since the early 1900s. About 110,000 of them are still operational. The other ones basically are orphaned or abandoned and many of the problems, issues, and concerns you have in Pennsylvania, you do have here in Ohio. And we do have an orphan well program there. Coal-fired electric generation, the number of electric generation facilities, that a lot of that coal that was mined here basically has gone to feed in different things. It's frightening to see basically how those are being decommissioned, taking offline, retired, and other types of technology basically are coming in, especially natural gas-fired turbine generation. With that in mind, you're seeing transmission systems, both pipelines as well as electric lines being totally redone, refitted. In Ohio, that's 39,000 miles worth of pipeline systems alone. New, old, uh, everything from local distribution to large scale transmission lines and different things. Landforming, repair, remediation of ground, basically that was disturbed literally decades ago is going on rare earth mining, which you're hearing about. You know, when we talk about slag piles, the waste coal and different things that were used in many of those mining operations since the early part of the last century, the number of companies who know where they're at have the map, and you're talking about rare earths that are needed for magnets, technology, electric generation, many of our computers here today, large concentrations of those. Will you see mining again, basically, in this part of Ohio with regard to that? The answer basically is yes, which means you'll have to revisit these environmental concerns very much again. Water quality issues, brines, acids, ammonias, a number of things. I can still show you places here in Ohio as well as in Pennsylvania and West Virginia where you still don't drink the water and consequently the energy production facilities were retired, decommissioned, buried, hidden right after World War II. Past reclamation, it's almost, I would also say is this, is that um, multiflora rose, autumn olive, paper lacquer used as fertilizer, a number of different things are going on with regard to that. Invasive species, these are all things we're trying basically to deal with on successive waves of energy development. You now have this one. And I do have to say, and I agree basically with my colleagues here at the table, when you take a look at the technology, when you take a look at the science, when you take a look at what they're doing and different things, do we have a handle on it this time? I think we have a better handle on it this time than we've had in consequent waves of energy development. But the question is also is this, and you are correct here in Pennsylvania as well as in Ohio, you're talking about billions of dollars of economic activity. Billions. The question is, yes, you're going to be using some of that and investing in repair, remediation of current types of things you're seeing basically with shale drilling development. The question also becomes how much of that should be used this time to take a look at the legacy types of things. 
how much of those resources going forward can be used for repair, remediation, doing a number of things with earlier types of energy development in this particular region. Yes, the companies basically are here today saying, you know, we're going to clean up our mess when we leave. Well, what about the messes from everybody else who there were challenges at that time basically with regard to that? What is going to be invested in being able to address some of those particular legacy issues? Also, I want you to think about this with those billions. And this is always a discussion here in Ohio, as well as I'm thinking Pennsylvania and other places. Quality of life for the people who are in the area. Yes, agriculture is big, animal husbandry and different things. But also, too, if this is the last wave, because we're now down into the source levels with regard to oil and gas development, what are we going to do in this region of the United States when that leaves? What investments are we making today with regard to education, industry, manufacturing, technical work that when oil and gas does leave, what are we going to go into next to keep people here? Quality of life issues regarding that. Education, facilities basically for homes, villages, farms, those particular types of things. Again, that's all part of the process. I'm very glad basically to be here. I'm very glad basically to continue the conversation. I think at this particular point, it's time to start talking. Let's talk. So I've asked all the panelists to um, come up with questions that they might want to ask each other. Um, I neglected to mention in the overall schedule that we would love to have a conversation with you all also. So there, we will reserve time um, for you to come up to the mic and um, talk, to you, talk to us about what's top of your mind. Um, just a, a couple of things while y'all are thinking about questions you might ask each other. You know, I, I'm struck by a, a couple of uh, themes that have run through your comments. Um, the first is this question of what do we do with these historical legacy issues that we know are already there. Um, so this repair and remediate the historical issues um, that are maybe just finding all of the historical issues um, is, is a big challenge when we think about environmental legacy. Um, but associated with it is this, this preventing them in the first place. So I hear some glimmers of hope around improvement of the technology and our ability to actually um, prevent the, the risk from happening in the first place. And I think that leads into what are we going to do in the future? So what do we do with known financial gaps? What do we do with evolving and changing technology? What do we do with, with scope and scale? Um, and then I, I want to, I think Dale's the only one who brought up reclamation directly. And, and I want to tie back to something we heard a lot in the national conversation. Um, and I, I, I love this, will you see mining again? Um, yes, you will. And what are you going to do with this, with this next wave of mining after you rec reclaimed? Um, and it, it contrasts really strongly for me um, from a, a talk that Dave Glatt, who serves on the round table, has given around North Dakota. His, his framing of it is, um, what do, when the landscape is quiet again, what does reclamation look like? But I love that the direct contrast with the landscape well, has never been quiet and it may never be quiet um, in the Marcellus and Utica, which might be quite different than other areas of the country. So with that, if I, hopefully I've given y'all enough time to jot something down or think, does anybody have something that they're ready to engage with their fellow panelists on right off the top? I'd say I'd be building basically what you've said here, because this is my main major question. I think we've all hit the nail on the head just a little bit differently, is that legacy issues with regard to things. And I know Scott's talked about it, and Susan's talked about it, and Jennifer, is that, you know, in years past, we've had bonding. We've had programs, basically, that have tried to attempt to have financial resources to do a number of these things. And those basically have either failed or they found out that the technology was much larger than the money that they have collected basically remediated. If we're talking about a new strategy here in the region or nationally with regard to being able to do the repair or mediation and the work that needs to be done, what should that look like? If these traditional things with that, well, you give me a, a fee when you do a license or we're going to do a bond and different things, and um, those resources are not adequate to do those things, what do we do going forward? How do we pay for it? How do we provide it? How big should the scope basically be that you see it? 
So I want to answer that question because I obviously I think about it a lot. Um, and before I do, do you mind if I just tell you guys a real quickie story? No, go. Because I want to brace people for some of my ideas. Um, and I apologize for some of the folks that have heard this little story before, um, but it's about you know, being challenged to think about solving problems in new ways. And uh, so to um, nine, March 2nd, 1962, um, Wilt Chamberlain played like the greatest game of basketball ever in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He scored 100 points. Yeah. Never sco no one scored even close to that since. And that game, he, uh, he made 28 free throws out of 32 from the line. That's the, the, no, no one's ever made that many free throws. And until recently, no one's even attempted uh, that many free throws. So 87.5% oh, oh, from, from the line that game to, to reach 100 points. And up until that point in his career, Wilt was about a 40% free throw shooter. And, uh, but obviously that game, he was magnificent. And that year, he'd actually raised his his average up to over 60% from the line. He was shooting the ball underhand. He had a contemporary that played with him, a guy named Rick Barry, who only shot the ball underhand, Hall of Famer, 90% free throw shooter career. Why am I bringing this up? Why, and oh, I should also mention that Will, after that year, went back to shooting the ball overhand, went back to a 40% free throw average. Um, he, if he would have kept shooting the ball underhand, he might, they might have never lost a game. But in his autobiography, he explained why he did it. He said, I felt like a sissy, I, 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 and I didn't like, you know, people were making fun of me. But why did Rick Barry uh, shoot the ball underhand despite the same – Rick Barry, it turns out, does not care what people think. <laughs> so, so I say that because the, in order to address this problem, we're going to need to do everything. I mean, the problem is money, right? This is one of those things that you can fix it when you have money. But where does that money come from? And one of the so one of the solutions to this problem, and is a healthy oil and gas industry. Um, since 1989, DEP has used its plugging funds to plug 3,700 wells. Now our records indicate, over a longer period of time, um, the industry's plugged 64,000 wells. They plug many, many, you know, more wells per year than we do. So part of this is to ensure that that we don't have a, a, a financial system that just simply puts like smaller operators out of business. It's fine for me to say, yeah, we need, we need full cost bonding tomorrow. Well, what does that mean to a, a company that might have a thousand wells and now has to come up with like, tens of millions of dollars, you know, in the next day, they're more likely to, it's more likely to induce mass well abandonment than it is to solve the problem. So, so we have to be, we have to be smart about that. The other thing we have to do is we have to throw every tool we have at it. And like one of the tools that we're using is our Good Samaritan Law, coupled with what we call an area of review. Um, well, before unconventional folks frack wells, they have to look around and find abandoned wells in the area and identify those wells that, that might pose um, a risk. And I've been pretty pleased to see that a lot of these companies are looking at wells that are you know, on the fringes. Dr. Brantley showed the upper propagation, uh, fracture propagation, and, and, and rather than use that as kind of a, a barrier, folks are, are being more conservative, but they're also concerned with, with excessive plugging costs. Um, so we are, we are allowing operators to utilize our Good Samaritan Act to try to plug a well, and if they're unsuccessful, then, then they can walk away without, without environmental liability. Obviously, if they create a problem, if the well now starts to leak, or, or if they do frack into it, they're going to have to address it. But we want to encourage we want to encourage folks when to remove every barrier to plugging wells uh, that we can. And even that's only going to be like scratching at it. So I think we have to start thinking about entirely new ways of dealing with financial assurance. Like uh, some of the concepts we've kicked around is having basically a trust administered by, by perhaps even a, a third party, like the way we do with mining, where every ton of coal money, money goes into a, a trust administered by, I think it's like called the Clean Water Trust. And, and as well as, as a mines need to be reclaimed, they, that money is there. So you're now removing the disincentive to keep a well in production that should be plugged because there's no, the, 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 fi the financial cost to plug the well is not borne by the operator, it's borne by the trust. So those are some of the, some of the ideas that, that, that we have, but um, it's, going to take, it's going to take every tool in the, tool in the toolbox if we're going to even make a meaningful uh, dent uh, on the, on this, on this problem. 
Scott, I'm curious about the the, um, the good SAM piece of it. It seems like this is just technologically so much more complicated than the, the AMD issue where like TU has been able to do some some work around that issue. But if we were to, to try to sort of engage in, especially, you know, if, if we had an oil well that, that was leaking in, in, in an area that was of concern to us, that, that's not something that we can tackle on our own. Um, so the good SAM piece of it has to be. You could apply for a uh, CFA grant. <laughs> So please do that. <laughs> you bring a very valid point. Let me ask you this, because I'm, I'm just thinking of this, is that um, we've been talking here about the producers, and don't get me wrong, I think there's a tremendous amount of responsibility if you're an oil and gas production company, if you're a coal mining company, those folks basically taking responsibility to clean up some of the things they've done with regard to that. But I also take a look at, too, who's the ultimate consumer? I still use gasoline. Sure. I still use electricity. Some of it comes from wind, solar, biomass, fuel, soil, and for coal with regard to that. We are all basically dependent on energy and will be for quite some time into the future. Uh, with regard to that, what is our responsibility as consumers with regard to this particular issue? And should there be some sort of assessment, some sort of fee, I hate to say the word, tax or whatever with regard to that that takes care of investing in besides working with the oil and gas production companies and the coal mining companies the producers additional funds and resources to go for repair remediation those things do we feel as though our, our, our local state and national governments basically have a feeling for that yeah i think you're thinking unfortunately just the right way i mean shooting the ball underhand and winning it's not it's not a, a, I know for a fact that people will balk at, I didn't drill that well, I didn't get paid a royalty out of that well, why do I have any responsibility for it? Well, it's polluting the groundwater, it's threatening the safety of, of neighbors that may have been in the, in the, same, in the same boat. Um, if, we, if, we, if, we, if people think that this is a problem that should get solved, then we have, to, we have to be prepared to do things that might be a little bit unpalatable if it actually solves the problem. So I want to invite Jen to join in the conversation, um, particularly around the supply chain. Um, yeah, well, I have another, well, go. just to follow up from what um, Dale and David and Scott uh, mentioned, but I, I like your analogy for thinking outside the box here, Scott, and I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on the debate that's going on in Pennsylvania um, about um, trying to impose a severance tax, and if that could, <laughs> I know a can of worms here, but you know, sure. it's something that the governor has repeatedly tried to get um, on the agenda, and I wonder if that might be a way to help, you know, fund a trust fund. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, other states uh, are in a significantly different uh, financial situation with just respect to funding the oil and their oil and, own oil and gas programs and having other resources available to them because of having a, a sensible severance tax. Um, this is, I'm gonna step back, I'm the environmental protection guy, and I'm not the tax policy guy, but it's certainly, it is certainly a potential significant source of revenue that could be could could be devoted to this um, this subject. So, so we focused, you know, this first part of the conversation on I guess the first thing that's on top of everybody's mind: money. So, how do we get more money into the system? How is there enough money? How does that work? Part of what um, I think drove a lot of the national conversation were questions around technological improvements. And so I'm wondering whether you all have observed and seen um, technology improvements making big enough gains to reduce your, um, your assessment of the risk for future environmental legacy issues. And what are those and, and how much does that play into um, how much money might we need in the future? So I'd be happy to start with that because I think, I think, and this the industry deserves some credit. I think we deserve some credit for, for some of our enforcement actions drove technological change, but um, none of our enforcement actions got well bore lateral lengths to go from 3,200 feet to 15,000 feet. Um, having fewer well pads, having fewer wells, getting more gas out of the ground, that's solely, you know, on the industry, it, it's, it is going to be um, a significant factor and the footprint that's going to need to be addressed. But some of the other legacy issues, Dr. Brantley brought up some you know, states like I know Oklahoma has a trust fund to deal with cleaning up well sites. They, they can't plug wells with that money. They just clean up the, the mess that was left behind. And I feel that at 
shale gas sites because of some of the changes like pitless drilling, pitless drilling and fracking, um, lining the sites completely uh, for spill, spill prevention. Those are things that are, are not going to leave a legacy that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, even like topsoil conservation, for example, if you go to a lot of these sites, you see this you know, mound sit with grass growing all over it next to the site. That's, that's the topsoil that's been preserved so that when it comes time to restore sites, it's, it's available to, to get you know, healthy vegetative growth going again. So those are just three, three subjects that I think have, are going to minimize problems that, um, you're right, that's, that's, it's avoidance. We talk, you know, avoid, minimize. So you're avoiding problems altogether. Those are some of the technological changes that we've seen. And I, I would add to that um, the, the recycling of, of water. Absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously, that's, that's a huge, that was a huge concern of ours 10 years ago. And, and, and the fact that so much of the, the, um, the produced water is, is recycled is, is an, enormous, mm -hmm. uh, an, an enormous improvement. And I would just like to add that, um, and adding another dimension here, I would call the financing and the technological sides as necessary but not sufficient conditions to you know, help us think through these issues. We also have to put on the table um, issues of um, how to overcome the polarization in the debates, um, you know, because we have a very divided discussion about um, our, our oil and gas legacies, not just in Pennsylvania, but in the U.S. writ large. So, you know, how can we reform our regulatory structure um, so that there's more of a, what I'll call procedural justice focus, where, you know, all the different sides feel heard. Um, because if I can just reflect, like, the academic literature shows that, you know, one of the key strategies for overcoming polarization in debates such as um, unconventional oil and gas drilling is to make sure that every stakeholder feels that they've had an opportunity to equally participate in the debate. So even if you don't achieve an outcome that's fully what you wanted, if you felt that you got a seat at the table, then that, that goes a long way. And unfortunately, in my studies of um, oil and gas governance, um, you know, we're not really doing a good job on that side of the, um, of the equation. Just to, just to weigh in on that a little bit, they gave me another aside, microphone. Aside from the shield <laughs> network, I wanted to plug that too. Oh. No, I wasn't even going to say that, but you can plug it later if you want yeah. to. But um, <laughs> maybe we need to. Use I guess the, what interests me is the time scales <laughs> of response. I mean, one of the things that I tried to convey was the speed at which uh, the rollout happened in this particular play, as the as the companies figured out how how to get the gas out, and that happened way faster than communities could organize. Yep. I think it happened faster than the DEP could really respond, and uh, I think the DEP responded as fast and as well as they could, but it's, you know, it's that time scale uh, factor. And there's a big difference, you know, getting a community to weigh in on regulations or to, uh, to wrap their head around what's actually happening in terms of technology uh, or to understand what the health impacts might be. That time scale is long compared to how fast that the industry can, can make something happen and how fast the government can respond. And I don't know what to do about that. I mean, I, I, uh, Earlier this week, I was talking to uh, a, an audience of industry folks, and they were decrying some of the research that, that happened early on and wishing that the research that was being published was better. And I said, well, you know, it's very hard to get research funding in this area, even though there's a lot of fundamental questions and applied questions. And uh, why doesn't oil and gas find ways to get money on the table to fund academic research without conflict of interest, um, some kind of mechanism. And, you know, if that was happening, it might create, um, you know, inroads and in conversation, but, it, but that isn't happening. And then certainly when, you know, a new technology is developed, there's not the conversation already going in general. So we need to find ways to do that. Yeah, and some other countries um, are doing or are innovating in that space. So, for example, you know, Canada, the UK, South Africa, China, France, Germany, um, before deciding to go ahead um, with hydraulic fracturing and unconventional drilling, they convene national level government sponsored scientific panels so that those scientific discussions happened ahead of the policy debate and ahead of the decisions whether or not to go ahead so that they had, a, had some start on developing a toolkit. And that, that's something that I don't necessarily see happening um, across different industrial sectors in the U.S. So if you move towards more of that model, um, that could help, you know, overcome some of this polarization. So let me let me bring Dale into the conversation. Yeah. I think he's been. He's, he's had a no. For, no. Right? no, 
Um, it's, it's interesting you talk about this because you know, pu public, pu public policy going forward and planning, I can tell you this, with the energy developers and companies I've worked with, the at now time period when something needs to be done yep. is a 30 year time block. They are thinking that far out. I'll tell you this, one of the last times I was in Pittsburgh was at a conference where they brought out the Brown Rock and the Black Rock, Marcellus and Utica Shale. That was in 1995, and they knew then and scheduled out where they were going to be in 30 years, and they're only about 18 months off. They've known where they've wanted to go. Working with communities, working with local government officials, working basically with regions and different things that where you're doing future casting, where you're doing planning, where you're taking a look at particular types of things. How do you get them involved in the process? You know, when I started talking about that in 1995, 96, they all said I was crazy until I got a call from a farmer near in Columbiana County he said, you need to come and talk to me about this guy who wants to do an oil and gas lease. Well, who is he? Don't know, but I think his name is Mr. Marcellus and he's from Utica, New York. <laughs> and I'm going, oh my God, they're here. They know step by step and they're doing that type of future casting. What type of incentive, what type of program, how do you get people basically involved to take a look at things 35, 40, 50 years down the line because they're saying, I really don't need to worry about that today. But in many cases you do. And if you take a look at with our legacy issues, we're still needing to worry about that. I can still show you places in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Boy, this looks great. This is where a coal mine, a strip mine was back in 1973, and it's all nice rolling hills. Let's go over the ridge, because I can still basically take you over there, and you won't be able to walk 100 yards, because it was not done. How do you get folks, how do you get public policy rolling? How do you get communities starting to talk about this that far down the line? So one thing we've been trying that Jen alluded to and Radisson Vidich has been involved in is a conversation which we call the Shale Network Workshop, which we've been holding every year at Penn State since 2012, uh, where we get um, watershed groups, government folks, industry folks, academics all in the room, consultants, and we really try to drive conversation around data and we push sharing of data. Um, and it's been very successful in terms of conversations. I get all sorts of feedback every year about the, you know, the way the conversations keep going. But we've only gone from about 50 people to about 140 people. And so maybe you can generate conversations like that, but I don't know how you scale up and actually make impact. That, I, just, I just don't understand how you do that. So, um this is an area that's near and dear to my heart since all of my work is really around governance and the, the completely incompatible timelines between technological development, regulatory innovation, um, and community's ability to community and local population's ability to influence and impact the process. Um, so I could spend a significant amount of time sort of wrapped up in this space, um, but I'm struck by what Dale said and, and sort of the challenge he put to the group around planning and at what level and what body is the right place to have long-term planning because we're, we're, we are locked in um, from the regulatory side of really doing more of a site-by-site -site assessment. Um, we're locked in from the industry side based on, on the um, business confidential information that goes into acquiring leases and developing a drilling unit that keeps a lot of that information more confidential and not available for the public. I'm wondering whether there is any avenue for doing this broader planning basis that might start to get at avoiding and minimizing, other than for infrastructure, which there's, yeah. there's a different process. So I think about that. I also think about short term, because this question has always come up in many places in Ohio, and I think also in Pennsylvania, where I work with, with folks there, is that picture this, and here's my story, Scott, all right, picture <laughs> this. On top of a ridge in the morning, about 7.30, there's a school bus. At the bottom of the ridge is an oil truck. You have a lane and a half township road. Who has right of way? It doesn't say, but we all know the safety and the factors basically involved in the school buses being on the road at that particular time with our kids. 
There was nothing basically in state and federal law with regard to that. What did you do? And I tell you, we see this happening all the time in a lot of places at a county level where you bring stakeholders in at a table about this size and on a very regular monthly basis, you talk about the issues at hand. You have the folks there basically from law enforcement, county commissioners, township trustees, local government officials, community stakeholders such as Farm Bureau, the companies doing the drilling in the area and we're going, what are some of the problems or issues and concerns we really need to address? That came up, didn't say what it was going to say in, in Ohio law and I tell you this, technology moves at the speed of light, regulations move at the speed of smell. <laughs> um, which means this, they said, okay, this is what we're going to do and we're going to spread the word, is that between seven o'clock and nine o'clock, that school bus always has right away, period. Mm -hmm. And between two o'clock and four o'clock in the afternoon, the same thing. The rest of the time, oil truck. They said that's workable. Now it worked in one county, does it work next door? Might not. But still, and you're seeing this in many places, basically in Ohio, you're seeing groups around Marriott, if it works there, we're going, this is the way we're gonna do it. Columbiana County, this is the way we're gonna do it. Guernsey County, this is the way we're going to do it. Instead of being having black and white rules and propagating black and white rules and regulations, sometimes you have to work in the gray and find solutions local to do a number of things and continue to adapt. And I tell you, for some folks, that was rather frightening. I've never had to do that before. We've always had rules and regulations and I've always been able to take a look at the book and sometimes basically you don't have the book. Do you see that kind of flexibility or is there that opportunity for that kind of flexibility basically here in the region? I, I've been talking to a can number I, of the drillers I, about it. So I've got an exactly eye on that. the time. So, so before you answer, I would like those of you who would like to participate in the conversation to please come to the mic. Those of you who are online, um, please submit your questions. Um, and then I will let the panelists engage in this conversation for a little bit. And then we'll, we'll turn it over and get y'all's questions and participation. Sorry, Scott, please go. Sorry. Go, Scott. Oh, um, so, so for example, with respect to uh, noise impacts. You know, we've got to start operating, in my opinion, in, in more in the realm of like a best practices universe because we can we can do that quickly. And and if we can implement these best practices, because I'm picking on noise because it's a very it's much more difficult subject than many people realize uh, to evaluate evaluate a noise impact. I mean, it's one thing if you're in the middle of the woods, but if you're in like Apex Township here, um, there's a lot of different sources of noise, and uh, it's it's much more difficult than people realize. But if we can successfully operate in this best practices universe, we don't need to step into that, that regulatory space. I mean, one of my little catchphrases is that incidents invite regulation. And, and frankly, if there weren't so many incidents early on, then maybe we would have stuck with our old law and our old regs and we all would have patted ourselves on the back and said, yeah, we had it all figured out from the get-go. But that did not happen. So change had to, change had, had to, had to come. So Scott, you're talking about being a lot more flexible, a lot more innovative and in working in that particular realm to, to, to handle some things, correct? Well, it, if we're going to get it done, I mean, as, as you say, it moves at the speed of smell. It took us five years to update our, our unconventional surface activity regulations. And then we, and then we got sued. <laughs> we're still being sued over them. So it, we, we've got to start to try to start doing things a little bit differently to, to, to win. Do you feel like that you had a, 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 a relationship with, with industry at this point where out over the longer term that, that uh, Dale was talking about? Well, I'm working on that. Um, I, yes, I think that we've, we've definitely got a much more cooperative working relationship now uh, than we did in even October of 2016. And, and, you know, to your community engagement, you know, I had a really successful meeting with uh, Huntley and Huntley in Plum Township. Uh, folks know Plum Township. This is an, a, a community without resources. And in fact, the neighborhood I was in uh, you might have heard of Dick Thornburg. He was living there. So I'm pretty sure that guy could make some phone calls and get things to happen if he was upset. And we just had a, a meeting where Huntley and Huntley told the people where, where they're going to be and what they're going to do. And that, that just eased a tremendous amount of concerns. It wasn't, it wasn't vague. It was very specific. The pad's going here. The water withdrawal point's going there. We're using a pipeline to move it, not trucks. And that degree of specificity, uh, really seem to put people at ease. I think it's a model we should engage in DEP industry, engaging communities, you know, with, with some of the specifics of their, of their immediate plans. Clear communication of what we know and what we don't know um, goes a long way. We can go to the mic. Great. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Adam Peltz from the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, first of all, I love this panel. 
talk about all these issues for days and weeks and months and years, and I'm sure we will. Uh, but Amy's prompt was, what's at the top of, of our minds on environmental legacy issues? And I want to go back to an issue that um, Scott brought up earlier about a company that has bought 25,000 wells and has um, a very small blanket bond. So, um, so this is uh, this issue of financial assurance, bonding, uh, idle well rules, and plugging schedules um, for legacy assets is, is probably one of EDF's biggest um, concerns in, in, in this space. And so uh, this company, uh, which came into existence, private equity company came into existence around 18 months ago, has bought 60,000 wells in Appalachia. So I think the largest um, collections in Pennsylvania, but they also have maybe 17,000 in West Virginia and a huge number in Ohio, Kentucky, and Virginia as well. They may be the single largest operator by wells in the United States now. Um, and so they're a publicly traded company um, and their financial statements show that the amount of revenue that they, that they expect to get from these wells, even in their, you know, a rosy picture, does not even come close uh, to the plugging liabilities. And, um, and because of the rules and laws in some of these Appalachian states, as, as Scott said, no bonding for wells before 1984, um, you know, private equity companies like these are able to take advantage um, uh, of, of regulatory loopholes squeeze money out of these wells and then you know probably at some point go bankrupt and leave the states holding the bag which will um you know could could come to the many billions of dollars um west and it's an active live issue right now because the this company is still purchasing more wells and they're they're um trying to purchase six thousand in west virginia there's probably going to be a hearing in that state on this and if it is it'll be the first transfer hearing i think in in west virginia dep's history, um, but figuring out how to reform the bonding rules, how to um, not have blanket bonds for transfers, which Arkansas and California have adopted, you know, how to have idle well rules that um, don't allow, you know, a single MCF a year to keep the wells out of, um, out of plugging responsibilities. I, I think that um, a way forward would be for the Appalachian states, especially Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, who I know the regulators have met before in a sort of tripartite regular conversation. I think this issue of you know this company in particular, but also preventing future companies of this sort from taking advantage of the states to get together and, and figure out um, options and plans of actions. Other states have policies in place that, that stop this sort of activity um, or at least curtail it. And so looking at whether those sorts of rules could be imported um, into this region, I think would be useful. And, and I'll also say on the technology um, front uh, that plugging costs, you know, if plugging costs plunged, then this would be um, much less of an issue. Now that's somewhat Pollyanna-ish, but there are new plugging technologies that are coming online that use resins rather than cement that I've seen some figures that you get a better plugging job for much less money, much faster. So I could imagine DOE FE, the fossil energy branch putting some money into this. I mean, there's, there's, you know, real high value in getting at, at, at the, um, uh, at being able to cheaply plug all these legacy wells. Thank you. Sorry for soapboxing, but it's, <laughs> but it's important. I appreciate it. Um, so regular, ne the necessity of regulatory innovation, um, as well as technological innovation for addressing legacy issues, another consistent theme, um, as well as the challenges around well ownership um, and the problems that that can lead to. Does anybody on the panel want to respond, riff? Um, I, I've got a completely different subject that I wanted to bring up and that you brought up like planning. And, mm -hmm. and one of the challenges that, that we have is frankly, it's private property ownership. We can do all the planning we want, and the guy says, "I don't want that pipe." I, I'm, I'm, I, I sign the lease, and it says I get to say where the pad goes and where the pipeline goes, and that's kind of the end of that. Um, we're not going to we're not going to uh, have eminent domain for well siting and for gathering line siting in the state. It's just not going to be a political reality. So now we need to look at other tools that we have. How can we incentivize the kind of um, eco to address the ecological issues I think we're fundamentally talking about here. So we've, we've got some people at the microphone, but I also think we have, do we have any online questions that, one? 
Um, I think this is a, a clarification question for Scott. Um, can you say how many of the 200,000 unplugged wells in Pennsylvania have no location? All of them. One, yeah, we just, of those wells, we do not know where they are at. We know where about 11,000 of them are. So lots of known unknowns. Hi, uh, John Stoltz, Duquesne University. It's great to, I'm um, very glad that you're putting this together and, and to hear this esteemed panel. Looking forward to this afternoon as well. Um, I did want to make a comment about uh, uh, the complaints. And in Pennsylvania, between 2004 and 2016, there were 9,442 complaints lodged with the DEP regarding oil and gas operations. Over 4,100 of those had to deal with water issues. So that's number one. Secondly, although the data that Sue showed that it was a downward trend by 2012, that also correlated to a decrease in drilling. And by 2014, that trend reversed itself. So it's clear that we still have issues because if you look at the number of complaints compared to the number of wells being drilled unconventionally, and I can actually say that the data also says the conventional guys are not to blame, um, that, that there's a, uh, a parallel to that. So we still have some issues. The other thing with regards to the legacy issues, I've analyzed now over 1,200 water samples across the state, focusing mostly on southwestern Pennsylvania. But most of the impact that I see in private water wells is from legacy oil and gas and coal. And yet it was stimulated by the new activities because um, it's rather rigorous. So again, we have this issue where if we focus only on the fracking, we're ignoring the fact that this operations, these operations can exacerbate these legacy issues and the loss of potable water for many of the citizens of Pennsylvania. Thank I think you bring a very valid point because you're seeing the same thing in Ohio. And again, like I said, at the beginning of my point, this new technology, these new issues bring to light a number of problems that we've seen. Case in point, I'll tell you, in Ohio, you know, the regulations say if you're going to do a new horizontal drilling array within so many feet of where that well pad is going to be, you have to sample every well in that particular area prior before you bring the first truck in to do the first spot. Now, I would also say this. One of the things that we've been working on, too, is this, is that in many places in Ohio, you see housing stock that's over 75 years old. And you see basically when you talk about on-site wastewater management with septic sewer systems in septic tanks and those, many of them in Ohio until very recently, you had no inspection once they were created. We've had a number of issues where you've done that testing and other, like the University of Cincinnati study and others have done testing with regard to that and found these issues before drilling has started. And you have people here basically that really need to work on and in many rural communities en masse redoing their on-site water systems. For many of those folks, that's six to $7,000 a shot to redo a septic tank and do, redo a water well. The question also becomes basically is this, once you open that up and people discover that and you have several hundred people under that issue, how do you pay for it as a county government? Which means this, when you're doing these kinds of tests and different things, and, and many folks have found this out too, is that this is also a law of unintended consequences because when you're looking at one type of technology and one type of issue, other issues are going to surface that you are going to need to address. And how do you do that? And then to add to this too, the pre-drill testing is only for gas wells. It right. doesn't include pipelines or injection wells. And in the case in Grant County that I was involved with, we had to go and provide free water testing for about 30 families because they couldn't afford it. And yet they lived within a two mile radius of the injection well. And yet they weren't gonna get their water tested prior to. In Ohio, we have a lot of small towns that grew up in the coal industry in Southeastern Ohio who all have water towers because it got to be so prevalent in the 80s and 90s that you literally those small towns they had all those, you know, the company store and different things and all those small houses had their own septic tank and their own water well. They saw the problem. USDA Rural Utility Service, we worked with them. I remember helping with regard to write a lot of grants at that particular time where you did 
those municipal water systems to address that yeah, but pu public so, water so is not the solution to oil and gas we are standing between people and lunch no. okay. um, so can, can we I say can, can i say something pause, pause for, for, for just one second because because i want to i want to check in on the time um, we have one more question standing so i'm looking to people who actually can give me some some guidance are, are we good to go for a couple more minutes so at that i, I Scott spoke first, Sue spoke more, more <laughs> assertively. Um, so you two are muscle for who gets to go. I, I just wanted to say that I appreciated that last speaker. I don't, for our online audience, it's, it's uh, John Stolt at Duquesne University. I appreciated your comments. I didn't want the audience to think that I had intentionally stopped at uh, 2013 and, and was trying to be duplicitous. It's, it's actually difficult to pull all these data together and, and look at them, and that's as far as, as, as I had done in that, re in that respect. So, you know, I honor your comments, but I didn't want it to be out there that I was, like, being duplicitous about complaints. Good morning. This is a, 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 a great program. Uh, my name is John Balakis. I'm with Woodard and Curran, and this uh, question actually is for Mr. Arnold. I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm a professional geologist. I'm intrigued that Ohio has been able to convince its farmers, because I think at the end of the day, farmers probably own more water supply wells than anybody else does and have a, has a pretty good voting block, certainly in, in, in our state of Pennsylvania. But how did you end up getting regulations in place for water well constructions? Uh, I, I don't think we a well have that. construction yeah. um, that you have there. Yeah. It's interesting at this, and I tell you, I will preface that by saying we've done a lot of education work with folks. And we've done a lot of oil and gas development since the beginning of the last century. And the collective experience that we've had with horizontal drilling in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s saw that we needed to do a number of particular things. And consequently, one of those had to do with current technology in the 1960s, especially around Mount Gilead with the Tupelo uh, gas strike, where that was the last unspaced wildcat strike basically in Ohio where you saw water problems around Chesterville and all had to do basically with the casing construction. At that time, you saw successive things with regard to the cement and the layers. Also too, going back to 1913, in many counties in the state in the 1930s, you did well records, which means this, when you drilled a well, you had samples and you knew every geologic layer where you were going through when you were drilling and the water table. And from border to border, our, our entire water table is mapped, which means when you went to drill a well, you knew exactly where it was at and you knew exactly in your permit what your diagram would be with regard to cementing, with regard to that to protect the particular well. In Ohio, that was precision. If I understand correctly, and I can stand to be corrected, working with some of my friends in Pennsylvania, they had some idea with regard to that. There were targeted areas, but there was not the precision that you saw with the data in Ohio. That's what I believe saved us and why we have those regulations that had for some time. Yeah, no, thank you, because I think at the end of the day, when we talk about these issues in Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, Texas, other states have come up with a mechanism to address um, some of the questions that I've heard here today, and I think it's one that is a legacy issue of regulation or lack of regulation in Pennsylvania that I think eventually will have to be addressed uh, as well. And I, I guess it's also directed at We, we actually Mr. attempted Curry. to promote uh, water well construction legislation, and it was basically labeled a communist conspiracy. Right, right. That, that, that's why I bring it up. <laughs> and again, sir, I'll tell you this. The incidents were in central Ohio, Morrow County, where you saw this happening consequently. That was in 1963. That was in reaction and in direct result, basically, of the issue that we had basically at that particular time. Again, I can understand where Scott's talking about with regard to Pennsylvania. What we encountered in 1963, you started encountering now with Marcellus and Utica Shale. And you're, again, if you take a look at the history, and I was very young at the time, you saw a tremendous amount of debate to get those rules and regulations basically in place. It was not a slam dunk deal. And so that type of public discourse, that type of education and outreach and things, those types of challenges were addressed at that time. And I'm sure our folks in Pennsylvania are trying to address them here. 
Okay, thank you. If I could just ask one brief question, which would really go to the rest of the panel, which is about uh, the Merriam paper, uh, Landscape Context Matters. I know it involves Trot Unlimited and USGS, and I, and I just, I didn't hear it brought up I didn't hear it brought up as one of the more recent publications about how essentially uh, USGS has looked at landscape and oil and gas development in Pennsylvania and has come up with what I think is a bit of a nuanced context for the interaction of landscape and um, development. And if anyone wants to speak to that, great. It's a, I guess it's a early 2018 paper uh, from USGS and, and I think tried unlimited. So thank you. I'll to, I'll, yeah, if it's Stroud Unlimited, it wasn't uh, it wasn't in my on my radar screen, so I'm sorry I can't speak to that. So um, I, we are at time, and it is lunchtime. Um, I want to thank the panel for a, just what I had hoped a free willing and engaged conversation, and thank all of you for participating. Um, do I is there anything logistically that I need to say about lunch? It's out front. Go eat it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's out. It's out, out the doors. I'm look forward, looking forward to continuing this conversation. Um, over. Thank you very much.